In this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about um, conservation laws, which are very important in physics and astronomy. And one of the most important is the conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum says that the total momentum of interacting objects cannot change unless there is an external force. This is a direct consequence of Newton's first and third laws. So interacting, interacting objects will transfer momentum between each other through equal and opposite forces. So we can apply this to understand what keeps a planet orbiting the sun. And the answer, of course, is going to be the conservation of momentum. In this case, the conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum is defined as the mass times the velocity times the distance or the radius of the orbit. Or we could say it's also the momentum times the radius of the orbit. So the angular momentum, just like the linear momentum, cannot change unless there's some type of external force acting on it. In this case, that force has to be a twisting force to either speed it up or slow its rotation down. And we call that type of twisting force a torque. So as the Earth orbits the sun, the only force is directed towards the sun, so there's nothing causing the Earth to twist um, or to speed up in its circular path. So it will continue to orbit continuously around the Sun. So angular momentum then, which is the momentum times the distance r, or the mass times the velocity times the radius, is equal to a constant. And we give it the symbol L for angular momentum. So if I'm an ice skater, and I was to pull my arms in, since L has to be constant and my mass doesn't change, if I reduce R, I have to increase my speed. So I will spin faster by pulling my arms in or slower by pushing my arms out. Every four years, we watch the stakes for Olympic figure skaters get higher as they try to increase rotation in the air with their triple axles and quadruple toe loops. How do they do that? It's a scientific principle that we asked Olympic hopeful Rachel Flatt and Deborah King, a sports scientist funded by the National Science Foundation, to help explain. Figure skaters make it look so easy, leaping off the ice, rotating through the air, and landing in a graceful arc. But make no mistake about it, figure skating is one of the most demanding of all the events at the Winter Olympics. For 17-year-old Rachel Flatt, the demands of training for the Olympics have to compete with other demands. I basically head to the rink at around 6 o'clock. Um, I skate from 6.30 to 7.15. And then um, I go to school from 7.30 until about 12.30. And then um, from there, I go straight back to the rink. When she's on the ice, this AP physics student might want to consider the science that goes into her every jump. To see this science in detail, Rachel agreed to train in front of a special high-speed camera called the Phantom Cam. It has the astonishing ability to capture her jumps at rates of up to 1,500 frames per second. It's very cool uh, watching myself on the Phantom camera. You get to see every phase of the jump, and it's pretty incredible just to be able to see every aspect of it, you know, where exactly the placement of your arm is and where my head is. Everything is very cool. We brought the footage to Deb King, a professor of sports science at Ithaca College and an advisor to United States figure skating. A figure skating jump is a really complicated skill that combines a lot of different motions in it. They need to really optimize a lot of different conditions in terms of speed, force, vertical velocity, generating angular momentum, and put it all together in a package with just the right timing to execute the skill. Deb watched the phantom cam footage to explain what Rachel needs to get height and speed in one of her jumps. The first factor is angular momentum. In figure skating, angular momentum determines how fast you're going to be able to rotate in a jump in the air. So when you do a spin, if you generate more angular momentum, you have the potential to spin faster. 
going into her jump, Rachel generates angular momentum by pushing off the ice with her foot. Pushing off the ice also generates vertical velocity, which will help Rachel get high enough to do her spins. The vertical velocity comes from producing forces from the jump during takeoff. This is sort of where action reaction comes into play. As they contract their muscles and really powerfully extend their leg, they're pushing down against the ice. The ice will create a force up on them, which gives them vertical velocity. And it's pretty much the laws of projectile motion that the more velocity you have at takeoff, and this is vertical velocity, the more she can keep going fast, straight up, the higher she'll jump. When Rachel spins on the ice, she exploits a law of physics to rotate faster and faster, almost as if by magic. How does she increase her speed while she's spinning? The answer lies in her arms. When Rachel first starts to spin with her arms extended, she rotates slowly. But as she pulls her arms in closer and closer, she starts to rotate faster and faster. Rachel's following an important law of physics, the law of conservation of angular momentum. You can't go to jail for breaking this law. In fact, you can't break it at all. As you get a smaller body position, your speed goes up. If you get a bigger body position, your speed goes down. So they react in the opposite directions. <laughs> Back in her office, Deb King spins on an office chair to make the same point. What I'm going to do is when I'm spinning, I'm going to go from a really open position to a tight position, and you'll see my speed change. So let's give that a try. So this is pretty fast. It's slower, fast, slow, fast. And I'm going to keep going, and the only way to stop is going to be put my foot down and grab the table. I'm really dizzy right now. <laughs> If Rachel can keep her body straight and hold her limbs in close, she'll achieve a higher rate of speed. But it's not as easy as it looks. It's hard to stay as straight as possible with every force. You know, you're basically being pulled out everywhere. Um, so it's easier to stay in when you're crossed with your hands and your legs. It just makes the jump more efficient. But no matter how much attention she pays to the science of her jump, Rachel's road to the Olympics will depend on her making skating look effortless. You never know what's going to happen. The unexpected is, you know, it's, it's amazing. <laughs>
The thermal energy is related to the temperature, but it's not the same thing as the temperature. Um, the temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles in the substance, where the thermal energy is the total energy. So the thermal energy is a measure um, of the total energy. Therefore, it depends both on the temperature, the average kinetic energy of the particles, plus their density. Um, ex one example is if you've ever baked cookies, um, you'll have your oven at 350 or 400 degrees, and you can put your hand in the oven without burning it, even though the oven's at 400 degrees, as long as you don't touch any of the metal parts of the oven. But you wouldn't put your hand in a boiling pot of water, which is not nearly as hot. It's only 212 degrees. So what is the difference? Well, the boiling pot of water has more thermal energy because it has a higher density of particles, even though each particle has less kinetic energy. The oven has a lot of kinetic energy in each particle, but there aren't enough of those particles to contain a lot of thermal energy. Another type of energy that we deal with in astronomy is gravitational potential energy, and we've already talked a little bit about that. Um, you know if you were to climb a ladder, the higher up the ladder you went and jumped off, the faster you would hit the ground. So the higher you are, the more potential energy you have. And the gravitational potential depends on a couple of things. It depends on the object's mass, how high that object is above the ground, and the acceleration due to gravity or g so the potential energy due to gravity is the mass times the gravitational potential times h or mgh in astronomy this is very important because i can have a very large cloud of gas and this large cloud of gas is all being attracted so it has a gravitation is attracting this cloud of gas and causing it to contract and so it's as it contracts losing potential energy and that potential is being converted then into thermal energy so Einstein told us um, back in 1904 and 1906 that mass itself is also a form of energy. Um, probably the most famous equation in the world, E equals mc squared. Um, C is a constant. It is the speed of light. And so it is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So C squared is approximately 9 times 10 to the 16 meters per second. So a very, very small amount of mass, um, if it's converted entirely into energy, it produces an enormous amount of energy. So we can use this energy to run nuclear power generators. Um, we have it in our particle accelerators and, of course, in our atomic weapons. So energy is conserved. It can never be created nor destroyed. I will always have the same amount of energy. I can change that energy from one form into another, but the total energy content of the universe will always be the same. When we come back in the next part of the lecture, we will talk about how to work with gravitation operating between objects more than just here on Earth.